Hello everyone, welcome to another um, fantastic Lincoln Live Lounge. Um, particularly excited today um, because uh, we are joined by Europe's first ever professor in uh, veterinary behavioral medicine and we're lucky to have him at the University of Lincoln, um, Professor Daniel Mills. Welcome Danny. Hi, yeah, good to see you. And you, no, absolutely, absolutely brilliant to have you here. Um, just to let the, the, the viewers know, um, if you're wanting to come to Lincoln, if you're lucky enough to be here already, um, you can do an undergraduate in, in animal behavior and welfare and, and bioveterinary science, or at master's level, um, you can do clinical animal behavior, um, taught by our very own professor, world-renowned expert, um, Danny Mills. So um, this is what today's all about and it is your chance to get involved put all your comments in the chat and questions that you might have um, and we will endeavor as always to uh, to answer them I won't Danny will um, but if you have any questions at all whether it just be about Lincoln generally that's absolutely fine or just saying hello it's always nice um, just to say hi um, you might notice I'm not in an aircraft carrier um, and just to say I am in the brand new Lincoln Medical School so I'm just going to give you a little bit of our amazing facility um, right there outside it's, it's, it's absolutely magnificent and so if you do want to come and visit our amazing facilities get on the website and come and see us book a campus tour loads of opportunities to um, to come and see our wonderful university and beautiful city at that so let's get on with it shall we? Um, Danny, fantastic to have you here. Um, I just think first and foremost, can you just give us um, give us a brief introduction of, of who you are and what it is you do at the university? So yeah, as you said, I'm a professor of veterinary behavioral medicine. What that means is um, my specialism is dealing with problem behavior in animals. And at Lincoln, we're very fortunate that we have a veterinary behavior clinic. So we actually have clients coming in who have problems with their pets and the like, and we try to help them with that. The clinic also services industry. In fact, just this afternoon, I was speaking to a big uh, international uh, company who want to develop a, a new treatment to help animals, um, probably dogs. Um, and um, so, you know, we're not just dealing with one-to-ones, we're also dealing with the companies as well. And as a professor, I do a lot of teaching. Um, I enjoy actually the teaching mainly on the masters, but I do some with the undergraduates as well, um, both the bioveterinary science degree and the animal behavior and welfare, um, as well as the clinical animal behavior and a lot of research and uh, consultancy for industry as well. It, it might be worth just explaining a little bit about in the, those undergraduate degrees. Um, yeah, so the, yeah, so the animal behavior and welfare degree, uh, we actually in Lincolnshire, we developed the first undergraduate degree in animal behavior many years ago. And uh, it was a sort of predate, well, it comes to when I first moved to Lincolnshire, actually in the mid nineties. And the, I just sort of felt that there was a need for us to, um, at undergraduate level to teach people some of the skills and the science of animal behavior it was at that point it was really only available as a master's program and it's a great way of doing a biology degree but with an emphasis on behavior you know you know you can hardly switch on the tv at night without there being some behavior program well when the football's over at least anyway um, so um and you know it's it's a great way of studying a degree something that's interesting and if you study something at undergraduate level that you're interested in your chances are you're going to do a lot better uh, at it because you're enthusiastic about it um the bioveterinary science degree is um it's a non-clinical veterinary program so it's not about training people to um, become vets in practice although actually a number of our graduates each year do go on to vet school it's more about training the people that uh, are underpinning the science that both clinicians do. So um, if you think about, you know, the vet in practice, they're dealing with individual patients, but if you've got a, a disease that's coming through, then you depend on bio-veterinary scientists to perhaps either, you know, process samples or to actually work out what is the nature of this disease? Is it a new virus that has come in or is it a virus that's, you know, already known that's mutated? And so if you're interested in animal health, that would be very much more the sort of uh, program that you might want to be interested in. But they're all very much grounded in biology. So if, if you're doing biology A level or um, you, you know that you're interested in that area, as I said, it's a great way of 
doing a biology degree um, in a subject that is has got those applied elements. And I've always my background is first of all I was, I was I went to vet school I qualified as a vet and so I've always kept that eye on that applied side of things my research is both pure and applied I, I think it's, it's probably worth pointing out so if you come to Lincoln that that there's there's an awful lot of kind of practical stuff and we've all been in the labs and anybody that works here or studies here has seen all these amazing animals that, 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 that people are, are working with um, and I just I, I I'm kind of um inspired by that myself but I, if i was 15 16 17 18 years old and i just knew i loved animals and i was relatively bright what would your advice be what, what, what would you do yeah so I, I think it's an important point because you know there there are a lot of courses out there for people who are 16 plus whether they be um uh, as i said thinking about what they want to do at um, after GCSEs or whether they're thinking beyond that and there are you know there's the obvious pathway of working with animals in a very practical sense and um, sort of from from that point of view that um, you know the day-to-day -day animal management actually probably doesn't uh, for some places depending what you want to do doesn't require that higher level study if you really want to get into sort of the more specialist areas so for example people who work with exotics um, uh, caring for those exotics or perhaps offering something like this sort of specialist behavior consultancy which is very much the focus of our master's program then you really need a solid science foundation and I think a general point, that, and I think it's a really important point, is that Lincoln, what we offer is a science degree. It is not an animal management degree that is just focused on how do you feed and look after animals. It's teaching you biology, but using animal behavior and management and welfare in order to illustrate a lot of those points. And that makes it really very interesting. So yeah, if you're if you're smart, you're bright, and you you're looking at those um, opportunities, you know, um, people tend to think, oh, be a vet, go into practice. There's so much more that you can do in the animal behavioral welfare and health fields. Um, as I said there's enormous multinational companies. Uh, a place like uh, you know the U.S. Believe it or not. US pet owners spend about the equivalent of the GDP of a country like New Zealand just on their pets each year. Uh, you know, it's a massive industry. And, but in order to make a good pet products, you've got to understand what the pets are. And sure. you know, my bias is very much towards companion animals. And that means cats, dogs, and horses primarily. Um, we ha obviously have uh, an another professor in the department who focuses on um, reptiles. Uh, Professor Anna Wilkinson and again you know she's a real leader in the field uh, mm. and uh, what she's been showing that tortoises can do people didn't think that mammals anything other than primates could do about 10 years ago you know some of the abilities that she's shown that they have and that really helps us push forward the boundaries of you know well actually you know what is it that makes humans unique um, um, but equally you know how much we share in common um and how um you know those uh, understanding the continuity in biology as well is really important i can see we've got some questions come up we I don't know no no we, we we do have some questions and i was going to i mean i'm not surprised that we've got some so mm -hmm. early um but what i was going to say is, is guys whilst we've got Danny here um by all means get your questions in if he's a specialist is companion animals if you've got a question about your dog your cat um, then, then please do put them in the in the chat, and we'll we'll see. Um, I might have some questions um, as well for him. Um, actually, Rachel's um, question is is quite nice. Um, uh, is the MSc taught online at all? Okay. Um, and would it be appropriate for a self-employed dog trainer um, looking to become a certified animal behaviorist? That's brilliant. I'm um, interested in focusing on dogs and donkeys. What a the, the ultimate combination. Um, so yeah i mean so first of all we've got if you don't know lincolnshire we have bransby home of rest uh, for horses quite nearby which is a very big horse rescue uh, in fact my wife volunteers there so uh, and they have their donkeys as well so there's there are great opportunities and we're always working with our local communities 
An interesting thing that's come out of the COVID um, experience is that we had to look at, you know, social distancing. And as a result of that, we are hoping that within a possibly a couple of years that our masters will be available as a distance learning program. Um, so I'm, it's one of my priorities actually for the next 12 months and we're just about hopefully to appoint a new lecturer on the program as well and we'll work together to create a distance learning uh, master's program. It will probably involve an element of summer school as well because one of the things which our program we're very proud of is that we don't just teach the theory, we teach the practice as well. And whilst there are certain things that you can do remotely, you know, getting people in for some of the training um, is, um, you know, there's nothing better than being supervised through those elements. So um, we have had quite a few people who are dog trainers who uh, want to go on for the certification. And our master's program is one of the few programs that is actually independently accredited by the Association for the Study of Animal Behaviour, which is maybe what you're hinting at Rachel that is the certification independent certification scheme for um, clinical animal behaviorists um, so the by virtue of doing the master's program you automatically meet the requirements for the theoretical part the key thing is what about a little bit about your background just having lots of experience in training you know there's a lot of biology to understand and things like that so if it's something you're interested in and your background isn't in biology do get in touch with us and we can advise on you know how you can do access courses or um, courses that will make sure that you're properly prepared for study an msc is a postgraduate qualification so typically you know we'd expect students to be coming in with a, a 2 one honors degree or above um, obviously, if they're a vet, that's not an honours course. But if they, um, so, we have a mixture, and it's something we're very proud of. We have, you know, the co the master's program has a mixture of both people with backgrounds in animal training, as veterinary surgeons, veterinary nurses, psychologists, because a lot of it is dealing with people as well. And building that community is a really, I mean, it it it's a great bunch to teach actually, because uh, as I said, people come with diverse ideas and. You know, I, I I love doing it simply because each year not only am I teaching, but I'm learning from the students as well and they're sharing their experiences. So that's the distance learning um, program at the moment. In, so in relation to Elaine's question about any of the courses, the undergraduate courses are not available uh, in distance learning mode at the moment. But uh, as again, as a forward thinking university, we're always um, uh, you know, looking at that potential. And it's something we have been looking at because there's certainly a need in the industry, I would say, whether it be in the, those people that are caring for animals on a day-to-day -day basis to upskill them. And as we all know, you know, nothing is permanent nowadays, people are changing, but also the, um, an area of growing interest for me has been animal assisted interventions and animal assisted therapy. And I have a PhD student at the moment who's been looking at people's qualifications and how that impacts on the practice. And there is a real need for more qualifications there. So that's another area that we're currently looking at to potentially develop um, for people who are working in the industry, um, especially because uh, they would need it in some form of distance learning. So that's a bit of horizon scanning of what might be coming in the future, but. Um, no, that's really, re really yeah. useful and good to know. Thank you. Um, but what I will say to Elaine and Rachel is, is do come and see us. Um, it, uh, it's a fantastic place to be in a, 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 a beautiful city and, and do see what um, facilities you, you, you get at your disposal um, as well. Uh, there's other questions coming in. I just want to, before, and I, I promise guys, I, I will get to them as best as I can. I just want to get on to just a little bit of background, and if that's okay, about... Yeah. Um, why why study animals why is it so important you obviously love it but why is it so important to the world it's, it's an interesting one because as i said my area is particularly companion animals and that was if you go back 30 years the idea of studying companion animals as an academic discipline was really quite sort of unusual people use uh, animals like cats and dogs in laboratories to understanding developmental processes. So, you know, much of our understanding of the development of vision is based on work done on cats. 
But the idea of studying companion animal behavior, sort of, well, why would you? Why would you study their welfare? Because they're loved by their owners. Mm -hmm. the real problem is, and this is one of the things, when I first graduated as a vet, I worked for a charity. And the thing that really struck me there was that so many of the problems that I saw um, could be helped with education. And that's what got me interested in education in that first uh, area. Um, and, you know, so, you know, people just thought, you know, cats and dogs, they're not real biology, they're man-made animals. And, and it just sort of wasn't seen. And it was yeah. similar, actually, if you went back to the 60s, it wasn't until there was, a, there was actually a book published called Animal Machines by a lady called Ruth Harrison. And that transformed our impression of farming. Because what had happened after the Second World War is the country had become aware that there was a need to become much more self-sufficient. And intensive farming systems developed actually as high health and they thought welfare systems, believe it or not. You know, and you know, people now appreciate that battery cages are not good for birds and things like that. But they thought, well, if you if you do this intensive farming, you have all the animals together, they all come in as one group and they go out as one group, actually they don't get as many diseases. Mm -hmm. um, and that's high health. And the thought was health equals welfare. And it wasn't until somebody like Ruth Harrison came along and published this book, Animal Machines, and said, look, we're completely missing this part of animal well-being that is how they're actually feeling about things. And that actually triggered Parliament to think about these issues. And we came up with a thing called the Five Freedoms, uh, which has formed the basis of animal welfare law across the world. And it's developed since then into uh, concepts of dom domains and needs of animals. So come the 60s, people started to think, well, one of the things that Parliament concluded and the, the Bramble report that was produced said, we really don't know much about captive animal behavior. Um, this is a big gap and we need researchers to do with this. So it was probably in the 1980s, you've got the first professor of animal welfare in the world, which to me doesn't sound like that long ago. I know many of the people online that seem like ages, but you know, it is only 40 years ago. Yeah. Um, and so people started to do more and more work on farm animals to understand the welfare, because if you're going to use animals, we have, we do have an obligation towards them. And then come the sort of nineties, then ourselves here and a couple of other groups elsewhere in the world, you know, started to do more work on dogs and cats, because one of the things that was clear to me is just because you love an animal, that doesn't mean the animal's well-being is good. Mm -hmm. the problem is you can you know you can love your your dog but we know that a very large proportion of dogs and cats are overweight and that's and, and you've got to understand why that happens you can say well it happens because people feed their pets too much but it's much more complicated than that because actually as humans what we do is we use food a lot in social rituals you know if you come around to my house on a sunday you might have had a sunday lunch um, and you might be quite full and you come around to my house and I offer you tea and cake. Well, you're quite full, but it would be rude of you to turn down the cake. So you do it. And because we do that, we sort of impose that also on our animals. And so people often use food as an expression of their affection, which can ultimately lead to the problems of obesity. I'll just give you another example, which I think is a really fascinating one um, in relation to cats. Cats naturally eat, you know, a bird or mouse sized portion seven or eight times a day. They've got relatively small stomachs. Yeah. yeah. So they're designed to hold that sort of volume. Now, if you buy cat food for your cat and you put it out, if your cat doesn't leave a clean plate, most owners look at it and think, well, he didn't like that food. I'm not going to buy that brand again. Yeah. So the food manufacturers are now caught in this situation where they've got to develop a food that will cause a cat, because you feed your cat perhaps twice a day, that it will overfill its stomach and tolerate that because the food is so appetizing, which creates all sorts of metabolic problems. This taps into things like bioveterinary science we were talking about, you know, because if you take in too many calories in one given time and you're a cat, you're going to be at higher risk of things like diabetes later in life. But 
if the manufacturers don't make foods that do that, then they go out of business. Sure. And, you know, so understand, you can start to see the complexity. And this is, this is why I love behavior, you know, yeah. um, dynamic that exists between people and their, uh, and their pets. That actually it's a really complex thing. You can't just say don't feed your animal as much because intrinsically we want to share mm -hmm. food. We want to give food. We think of things like a clean plate. We need to bring about much bigger cultural changes in order to try and improve companion animal welfare. So things like the masters, yeah, we teach human psychology as well as understanding animal behavior as well. Um, I think I'm going back to your question, why study it? Because it's absolutely fascinating, you know, these sorts of problems. The really interesting thing about the dog is, you know, dogs were the first animals to be domesticated. Yeah. Uh, I've written, uh, I wrote an article many years ago saying there is no such thing as human society. Ever since humans have had a society, since they sat down into communities, dogs have been there. So our societies are intrinsically and always have been multi-species. If you go to the US, parts of the US, you know, in parts of the US, a child is more likely to grow up with a pet in the household than with a father figure. Now, that's a shocking statistic. And we know that these pets are quite important in child development. But most surveys don't ask about, they don't ask about the family, they only ask about the human members. So we've got this big gap. And as you know, we've been doing work during the COVID situation about companion animals and people's health. And we know that companion animals are so important and they've been immense uh, support for a lot of people with the social isolation. Um, but we know we're not considering them as part of the family. And okay, some some dogs do live out and that's fine. But the complexity and under, you can't label all dogs and owners as, as one entity. People have different types of relationship. Uh, as you know, we've done recent work on cats as well in the relationship and we identify different um, relation, <coughs> relationship types there. So, you know, there's so much and because dogs have been so much of human life that people have argued actually the two species have co-evolved we have certain abilities to read in dogs <coughs> because we've shared our life and being able to read them has been intrinsically important wherever sure. humans have gone they've taken dogs with them yes. so you know understanding even human society does require an understanding of animals as well uh, and you know they are such an important part and it's we're only now beginning to start to appreciate but the other interesting thing is because they share our lives they're subject to the same stresses and strains of us and my work is dealing with problem behavior a lot of it so you can have a laboratory model in a in a rat these are usually quite artificial of you know um, you might do a laboratory test if you want a real life model of you know take the dogs that are living with people and you can gain insights into some of the risk factors for yeah. human diseases as well. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that enormous crossover and it, you know, it, we're only really starting to scratch the surface now. I, wow. Um, I, I knew when you mentioned the, the, the cat thing, it would get, um, it would get um, a little bit of engagement, uh, mainly for myself actually, because I sudden realization that for years I may well have been overfeeding my cats, um, mm. and I hope that's um, affected other people as it's, it's affected me. Um, clearly, it has Amy, who's got in touch. Um, <laughs> to the point regarding cats portion size is fascinating. Clearly, my cat is just sticking to what she knows naturally. I have a lot to learn. We all have a lot to learn. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't know whether you want to comment on that actually, Danny. And just in terms of. I mean, just for the layperson who's been, who's Amy perhaps has been looking after cats and animals for years upon years, and still, you know, can can learn from from people like yeah. You. I mean, it, it's it's a really important point, and it's it's hard because the thing is, you know, when you, as a scientist, what we try and do is we focus on the science, and I just want to pick up on Jenny's point. Actually, yes, mm. it is a science degree. There is hands on, and there are hands on practicals. Um, but equally, what we at undergraduate level also uh, what we encourage students is to seize the other opportunities. Um, I remember many years ago, actually, when the former head of the School of Psychology said going to universities like signing up for a gym. You're not going to get fit by just signing up your membership at a place like Lincoln. 
you not only get the opportunity to the, the formal courses, but there are so many other opportunities. So we do have animals coming in, you know, for some of the research that we do. We have a database. We have a, a, a database called um, Pets Can Do. If you, if you Google Lincoln Pets Can Do, you can sign up your dog or cat or tortoise or horse even into our database. People volunteer their pets. They bring them in. And you can help out with some of the ongoing research and you gain a lot more that way. So, you know, not only is there the formal taught elements, but at undergraduate level, the best students, you know, they seek out the other opportunities. There are student societies as well, which will do visits to places and give you the opportunities. We have a very good relationship with Lincolnshire Wildlife Park. Um, if those on the master's program, we try to get you there. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't last year because of COVID. But in the first week we get you there it's part of a team building exercise but also um you know we know that the guy who runs it i've known for many years and usually students get to go behind the scenes um and in fact i was i was just there the other week um chatting to him and um yeah we're looking forward to seeing him again in september so you know whatever you do do think about the opportunities it's not just about the curriculum it's so much more than that and um, as I said, Lincoln, we've got things like Bransby Home of Rest very close by. We've got uh, loads of rescues as well. Um, so there's uh, the second biggest dog rescue after Dogs Trust, which everyone heard, is actually Jerry Green, which is a Lincolnshire based charity. And they've got various shelters um, around uh, uh, Lincolnshire and uh, Yorkshire. And um, again, you know, there are opportunities to work with those uh, as well. So, you know, what we don't think is that it's appropriate to just focus assessments, you know, for that to be a, a, the primary uh, element of the assessment of a, a science degree. And that's what makes our graduates so employable because they do have the practical skills. Uh, you know, they've gone out, they've got those skills, but they've also had a lot of uh, you know, teaching the scientific method and thinking about things. Being a scientist is not about wearing a white lab coat. Um, you know, and um, being a scientist is about thinking about problem solving in a certain way. You come up, you make an observation, you come up with ideas to explain it, and then you try to run experiments or ways. And, and an experiment doesn't mean necessarily laboratory, it could just be watching the animals and thinking, well, if this was true, I'd expect this. But if this was false, I'd expect that. And it's actually the information that tells you that it's not that can't be right which is the really powerful stuff with scientific thinking because it's we always look for the evidence that supports our beliefs that's a natural human tendency what makes you a scientist is you step back from that and you think of all the possible explanations and you design experiments to say this will allow me to disprove that one so i can take that out of the equation and that's how you make scientific progress and that's what a science degree, in my opinion, should do. It gets you into that way of thinking. In the first year of an undergraduate degree, you know, we, we introduce you to the general subjects and the general process of thinking. In the second year of our undergraduate degrees that we've spoken about, you do more of this subject specific matter. So you do more of the specific bioveterinary stuff or you do more of the specific behavior and welfare stuff. Because again, one of my friends who was a, a physicist, he said, you know, people say, you know, it's not rocket science. Well, actually, at least in rocket science, in physics, then we know what units we're talking about. If you're studying animal behavior, whenever you design an experiment, it says you don't have something like a centimeter or a, a molar concentration. You have to define your behavioral units for the study you're doing. So it's a great thinking subject. And that's what makes it really exciting as well. So, um, you know, so we need to... Uh, get people thinking and then in the third year you do uh, again sort of very applied aspects as well so you, you get the subject specific second year and the applied aspects in the third year and you do a, a research project and again the research project is about showing that you are in much more independent we do we put a lot of effort into supporting our students through that uh, process um, of the study and it's I don't want people to think oh a research project if they want to be a research scientist it's not actually if you go uh, you know for any job they want to see how you got on in your project because it shows about that balance between knowing what you can do and knowing when to ask for help mm -hmm. um, because you know we all need to reach out to others to ask for assistance when our knowledge gets to a limit 
and that's what we mean by being an independent learner is knowing yourself and knowing what you what you can do um Absolutely. so fantastic thank you so much I, I, there's lots of people get into it saying that they're they're, they're animals that their they're pets um have, have joined the research and loved it and 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 they learned plenty of themselves so thanks for that i i, I just want to get darren um, who's our producer, by the way? He's not just somebody over there. Darren's in the internet somewhere. I want Darren. Can you put a, a Angel Blue's question up, please? By the way, um, I asked people to get in touch about um, now that we've got Danny here. Um, here we go, Professor Mills. Are there any tricks to understand what my dog is trying to say to me? Okay, so yes. Um, what we well, what your dog is trying to say to you. One of the things that we teach people to do. The first thing to appreciate is the difference between what we call data versus your perceptions you know observations are descriptions so if you say you know i've got white teeth then we know what white teeth are yeah mm -hmm. if you say i've got bright teeth well your definition of bright might be different to mine that that's not objective yeah okay. so what you have to do and if you really want to understand especially things like the emotional state of your your pet then First of all, you have to be systematic in what you look at. As humans, we actually naturally focus on, anim on eyes. Uh, eye reading is really important to humans. Actually, when it comes to dogs, ears are much more valuable. The other thing to appreciate is there's no one behavior that means one thing. So a waggy tail could mean a friendly dog, but it could also mean a highly aroused dog that's about to bite you as well. So you can't take these things in isolation. So you have to systematically look through the whole of the animal, start at the head end, go across the whole body, read everything. You're looking for, first of all, the context of the behavior. What is it doing? In what situation are we? Um, so, um, for example, one of the experiments that we've done is when you're withholding a food reward, you know, is the animal sitting there thinking, oh, when am I going to get my food in a, in a state of excitement and positive expecting the food? Or is the animal sitting there thinking, when am I going to get my food? You know, yeah. frustrated, yeah. which is a negative state. And we've started to try and tease out some of the behavioral indicators and things like um, the position of the ears can be quite important. So when the animal is more frustrated, actually the ears part more. Whereas if they're in the more positive state in that situation, they, they prick up their ears a little bit more. Right. But it's not a question of, oh, pricked ears mean this. It means the way you have to read it is over a period of time, do I see an increased frequency of this and duration of these? So you can't just take those elements. So it's, it is quite a complicated thing. So we look for the context, we look for the behaviors, we look for signs of arousal. So things like the pupils dilating, owners sometimes say, he has this funny look in his eyes. And that usually means that the pupils, the black parts of the eyes have got bigger or the hackles have gone up, those sorts of things. Um, we look at those, we look at generally at the whole range of behavioral tendencies to make sense as to how that might uh, relate to the emotions as well. Um, and so, you know, by putting all of this information together, then we can start to test ideas. And this is actually one of the things I've been working on over the last 25, 30 years is to develop this systematic process of how we can make better inferences about the emotions of cats and dogs and horses in a field setting rather than in a laboratory setting. We do have, again, another professor in our department, Oliver Berman, is a world leader in developing some of the laboratory models of uh, assessment of emotion. Um, he developed a very neat system of asking an animal if the glass was half empty or half full to so teach the animal that if the food reward is over here, um, you know, it, it, there's, there's a bowl with food in, but if, if you're over here, then the food bowl is empty. And you look at the running speed and eventually the dog is running quick to one and slow to the other. And then you put the food bowl in the middle and you look to see, does it run or does it dawdle? Because it's right. it as being half empty or half full. If it runs, it's optimistic. And what you find is that stressed animals are more likely to dawdle because they're more pessimistic about life. And so these are the, that's the sort of laboratory model that Oliver's been working on. Uh, One of the things that, that I love about your research is that it's not just about kind of um, animal behaviors specifically, but it's about how we interact with them as humans. Um, and most recently, we, we've, um, we've had on the, the, the University of Lincoln website um, a cat quiz 
um, which I'd ask Darren to put in the chat or, 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 or on here, um, which proved incredibly popular. Um, it was, was responsible for about 90% of our website hits over the course of a, a week when it first came in, because it went all over the world from Russia to China. Um, indeed, I think it went to the Congo. Or it absolutely. Or, but basically, you can find out through this quiz, which the research was based on largely, um, what type of relationship that you, you, you have with your pet, with your cat. Um, and I, I think that's absolutely, because it does, a little bit like Amy's point, you, you start to question yourself whether you do think you're doing things right as an owner. And it can't just be for cats, it must be for whether you look after anything whatsoever. Yeah, so this, I mean, this this quiz, actually, the, the paper, and the paper is freely available. Um, if you well, if you go to, probably to my webpage, you'll find it, or if you Google me um, and put cat owner relationship um, into Google Scholar, you'll certainly find it. Um, but actually the work was done, the bulk of the work was done by one of our master students on the Clinical Animal Behaviour Masters, and it was his um, project. And I mean, he, he was very, very, uh, he is very talented. Uh, he got a fantastic response. He's Portuguese, so he did a Portuguese version as well. Uh, and actually there was very little difference between Portuguese and the English uh, results, which was encouraging. But we saw these different types of relationships. So um, and if you do the quiz, you'll get an idea as to what type of relationship you probably have with your cat. That, I mean, it's it's fun. And as you say, it, mm. the, the world's press picked up on it. Um, but it does have a very serious point because now we've got this way of characterizing the relationship. We're starting to now appreciate the emotional complexity of the nature of that relationship and what that might say about the way as, as you sort of indicated how you interact with your cat and the sorts of things that you can easily slip into which might not be good for the cat mm. yeah um so you know where your blind spots might be and that's sort of what i'm hoping to do next in the next phases of this is to then start right we've got this way of profiling the relationships now let's look to see whether or not um you know are owners with this particular relationship style, are they more likely to have overweight cats, for example, or yeah. are they more likely to have cats with certain behavior problems that are aggressive towards them and this sort of thing? Are they more likely to be multi-cat owners, this sort of thing, and 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 you you know, how they're likely to manage things. So, you know, it's really important to lay that foundation. And um, as you say, we, we've, yeah, when we did the research, we got an enormous response. Um, and I think the university website as well, we've um, we've had a massive amount of information there. And what's been interesting is because it did go global, um, we've had so many, well, I've had so many people contact me and say, you know, we're in the US, yeah, this works, you know, this works for us as well. So it's nice to have something that really, because sure. sometimes these things don't translate across cultures, um, yeah. but it, it, it does seem to work. But I, I think that moves us on quite, nicely into to my next um, more of a point than a question but that why it's so important why, why we're talking about behavior because it genuinely does help solve real world problems I mean, this is this is all very entertaining for people and people love their pets and this you know it's nice and fluffy if you have cats or tortoises or whatever but this is really really important what we're doing and and um yeah i just wonder whether you just just divulge on that yeah moment. So in, in relation to animal welfare, you know, the, when they've looked at a companion animal welfare, the two biggest issues uh, for companion animal welfare are considered breeding and some of the problems with breeding and then uh, animal behavior problems. And a lot of those problems, it's not a question of apportioning blame because, you know, the problem arises as a result of an interaction between an owner and their animal. And, you know, Often in the clinic, we have owners who say, well, you know, I've always had this breed of dog. I've always treated them the same. Why is this one different? Well, because every animal is unique. Mm -hmm. and again, is part of what we try to explore where it's traditionally scientists, you think there's this population and that population, how do the populations differ? Well, when you're dealing with clinical cases, you're interested in individual variability, which again is something that's quite fascinating as a scientific point. So, um, you know, and you know, so this is considered a big welfare issue, quite apart from being academically fascinating. Um, yeah. You know, there there are real issues here. One of the you know the, the 
some of the work that we've done during the COVID, as I've already mentioned, you know, the people's mental health and whether or not they had companion animals, there were significant relationships here, you know, that people's sense of isolation was so much greater if they weren't a companion animal owner. And we looked at things like also birds in the garden and, you know, how much contact we had with them, but it's particularly the ownership. And, you know, that is a, a very emotional thing. And we have to recognize that. And that's why just giving people facts doesn't help resolve the problems you know because you don't think with your head when you're thinking about your pets you think with your heart quite often um and that's you know trying to communicate and develop more effective messages is much more uh you know uh you got you've got to be careful i mean you you work in marketing i'm, I'm sure you you know this but um you know People have tried to say, for example, in with regards to responsible breeding, that you know these animals have all these health problems, to try and get that message across so that people won't, you know, get these pets. Unfortunately, the people who go for these breeds, when they hear you say that, what they hear is these animals have all these problems. They need a special type of owner who's going to care for them. That's me. So therefore, I will get one of these dogs. It has the complete opposite effect mm. that you would hope that message would do because you're giving a, a message that is very factual, but the person is processing it in a very emotional way. Um, so, you know, it's, it is a, it's a complicated, it, these are complicated issues and there's no simple solutions. And, you know, the, the field of, you mentioned I was the first professor of veterinary behavior. Yeah, this is a new field. That's the reason why there's, I mean, there's very few professors. There's sort of the, the veterinary specialization there's probably about 40 of us now 60 of us maybe in europe the whole of europe you know it's it's a it's a specialist area we're still scratching the surface it, i think by the the amount of questions that we've got coming in and just comments i think it probably speaks volumes just people saying hi and that it, it is fast hello holly marie thank you for uh, a lovely comment actually just kind of telling how, how fascinating it is such an important and fascinating subject and even it's quite it shows how emotive it is actually with with, with mark's comments as well um to improve welfare owners need to understand an animal's needs and look through the eyes of their animal to discover if you are meeting those needs what do you think about that I mean, how do yeah, you, how do you it's realize true it? it's, it's it's a very true point the difficulty that people have is they don't put themselves in the animals and this is why understanding yeah. the ecology of the animal is important you know a dog doesn't think like a human mm -hmm. and the danger is people become anthropomorphic and a dog the way a dog processes stuff is very different to a cat they're very different species yeah so you know dogs are naturally uh group living animals so the majority of them and we're making stereotypes here but the majority of them like to live in the company of others yeah and they, the way that they operate their relationships, there is a mutual dependence. Cats can live quite happily in groups, absolutely. But as a species, they tend to be much more independent. I, I mean, I used to have two cats. I had two cats. I didn't have a family of a pair of cats. They each had their own resources in the house. They did not socially bond with each other. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you wanted to sit and watch the football tonight, with a cat on each knee, it wouldn't work in our household because that's the way. And we didn't try to force it. We gave them a good quality of life living in that environment. So mm -hmm. understanding that other cats, you, they would pair bond. And this is one of the things that often we have to explore with owners is, okay, you've got five cats. Let's just work out how they interact with each other. Then we can work out how many social groups you've got. That mm -hmm. tells us how many groups of resources, how many litter trays, how many feeding stations, how many resting areas you need as a minimum then your cats can live happily with you yeah mm. and it's understanding those sorts of uh issues so that's why we need more work you know on the biology of these animals so we can un so we can look through things in their eyes or test our ideas of looking through their eyes i think you know i think people at school get taught more about animals that roamed the earth 150 million years ago than the one that's in their living room at the moment mm. and, and you know and it, you know why don't you teach biology using cats and dogs people can relate to that yeah absolutely 
Um, guys, we've probably got about five minutes left. So if you've got any more questions, do, we'll, we'll, we'll try and squeeze them in. So please do get them in. Um, and I'm just going to answer one just on account of Lincoln specifically. But, I mean, that is talked about Brasby horses and the facilities that we've got on campus here at the University of Lincoln Brayford Pool, where I am. Um, but also we have um, Rhizome Campus, which is um, in the beautiful Lincolnshire countryside. Um, and yeah, do we, just how far afield do, do, do um, undergrads and people doing their masters go, Danny, around the county? Okay, so, I mean, we've got the Rhizome Campus, as you say, it's about three miles north of the city. Um, and certainly there is things like uh, for the animal behavior and welfare students and the bioveterinary science. Um, historically, we've allowed students to get involved with the lambing there. We've yeah. got a fantastic new beef facility there, um, which is a fairly unique housing. So if you're interested in that. Um, so there are some practicals that are done out there. Um, uh, we try to do as much as possible on the Brayford campus simply to save students having to travel around. Mm -hmm. But there are, we, we bring in both guest lecturers, but also take students out. So they will potentially go on trips to Jerry Green. Some of that will be done through the course. Some of that will be done through student societies as well. The My, my plea for more questions um, as... <laughs> <laughs> we, we might now be pressed for time, guys. So we will do our best, and we, um, I'm sure that if you get in touch with with us, we we can certainly get there. There's a couple of ones here. There's there's two actually. I do want to pinpoint Rachel, who's obviously extremely keen to study. Um, what is your opinion on TV shows dedicated to training cats and dogs? The training methods they they oh. use. I mean, there's obviously lots of TV okay. shows. It does depend, but maybe an example or two. Of what's good? What's bad? You know. So um, I'm, I'm sort of going to give a plug here because one of the reasons why we've got to end is I, I straight after this, I'm, I, ha I also run a, my own podcast and uh, it's, it's open, it's free. You're welcome to do it. It's, uh, it's called uh, What Makes You Click. And I'm actually going to be chatting to a colleague in Vancouver um, who, a lady called Zazie Todd, and it's worth looking up her, her blog. Um, because she's done work on barriers to adoption of to humane training pr methods. And one of the things we've done work on here is work that is contributing to changes in legislation on the way that we train animals, the, the banning of what are commonly called shock collars, e-collar training and things like that. Um, because, and the problem is there is still a culture that persists in this and it makes great TV using aversives because what you see is you see the animal stop in its tracks. Sure. Unfortunately, you know, that's not good for animal welfare. Um, there is there are some very good um, uh, TV programs. There's also some very poor practice as well. And I think it encourages, you know, we to me, you know, even the language we use, we talk about obedience. So that sort of means that you should do what I want just because I want you to do it. You know, I, I, I like to get people and it's not about being politically correct, but just think about it. If you ask your dog to do something, you're making a request. Read your dog's answer to that. He might go along with it, but he might not sit because he might actually be in pain. And you yeah. need to look. If he's hesitant in that sitting and you think he knows how to sit, then why is he hesitating? Because actually, from a dog's point of view, it's a cheap lunch if you just do what your owner asks. You know? And so biologically, they work really hard to fit in with us. And if they don't, then actually we shouldn't be confronting them with violence and punishment in order to make them scared to disobey. We need to think, why aren't they going along with this? And stepping back from that and understanding that builds a much healthier relationship. And when you explain this to owners, you know, they, they go along with it. So be cautious with the TV. Um, it's interesting. You've got people like Victoria Stilwell, who is now a very strong advocate for positive reinforcement based training. She used to be one of these people and she crossed over and, she, you know, she's not afraid to say, you know, yeah, she she did the TV, you know, um, you know, the early series and she knew it made great TV. And she now says I was wrong, you know, and you've got to admire people like that. Um, yes, other right. people, you know, do need some education. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think it comes back to what you said earlier that people look for evidence to confirm their beliefs, I suppose. And, mm. um, yeah, it can be extremely damaging. I'm sure we're getting loads of lovely comments in from Helen, who's um, 
She'll be starting her, her master's later this year. I'm really looking forward yeah. to it, her master's. So, so that's fantastic. And we, we can't wait to welcome you, Helen. Uh, Mark Hardy again. Thank you, Professor Mills and the University of Lincoln for a great event. Um, I look forward to viewing more in the future. And you certainly can, Mark. Um, every Wednesdays mostly, but keep an eye on our website uh, and we will we will get back to you. Guys, there's, there's so many questions here. We're simply not going to have can I just pick up on a few yes, of them? Yeah, I can yes, pick up on some of them as well. So just uh, to answer a few of them very quickly, my cats, uh, do you have any volunteers for studies? Yes, please do sign up for the Pets Can Do database. That's how we recruit our animals. So get your pets signed up for that, please. Somebody was asking, uh, do we offer a course in animal assisted therapy? No, we don't at the moment, but as it is something we're looking at potentially in the future. So watch this space, um, TV shows, um, uh, There's a, a question from Maria there about um, her dog potentially being lonely after perhaps going back to the office after lockdown. Is that, is that something we can... Yes, yeah, so this is one of the issues that people are concerned about, that after lockdown, the welfare of the pets. And, you know, once some of the work that we did recently did show that um, actually during lockdown, the welfare of pets for a lot of them has, may actually have improved. That doesn't mean for some of them it has got worse as well. Um, uh, but if you, yeah, if, you, if you're going to be have any big change in your life, you need to in effect, communicate that to your pet and get them ready for it. So if you're going to be going out for longer periods of time, you need to start introducing those routines in advance. Um, you know, if you've got children, you know, you don't leave them in the house alone for eight hours the first time you leave them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the same goes with dogs, you know, you need to get them. So um, uh, organizations like Dogs Trust have a, uh, some good advice on their website. You might want to look that up. Um, and I, I'm pretty certain that Cats Protection probably have a similar sort of thing as well, if you're concerned with your cat as well. Um, so that's a quick way of, of dealing with that, um, of that one. Um, so just quickly, um, do, 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 um, I think if... Um, I think you've more or less... I think we possibly can. Um, including how will behavior benefit someone who wants to do go into animal behavior research as a career? Yes, it would. Um, we a number of our students have done the masters and then gone on to do PhDs. Um, in fact, I'm trying to think how many of my current PhD students, several of them, uh, have done our masters first. It depends on the area that you want to work in. If you're more interested in farm animals, I'd actually recommend a different masters in preparation. But a masters is always a good preparation for um, a research career as well. Um, and nice to see that somebody's dog enjoyed. Um, da, 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 da. Um, do I believe legislation needs to be changed to encompass licensing and regulation of breeders of all domestic species? Yes, is the short answer to that. <laughs> I, I thought that might be the answer. <laughs> um, I think we've covered it. I think so. Some more. I apologise if we haven't, but we are running out of time. No problems. Well, um, guys, we still have an opportunity, I guess. We, we talked about there's loads of other ways to get into it. It's loads of other, again, podcasts and, and, and websites, etc. Just give us a shout. Come and talk to us. Um, we're, we're a friendly bunch at Lincoln. Um, if, um the other thing if people are interested if you want to get an idea of uh, there's i have actually on my youtube channel got a uh, a three-part um sort of lecture on why love is not enough it's a lecture i prepare for the students and i decided i'd make it publicly available um so again if you google youtube what makes you click on my name you'll probably get there it's outside of the university simply just because this is the sort of thing i sad thing i do in my spare time <laughs> but it's just I, you know i love what i do and i think it's important that we get it out there to to everybody so you can get an idea of that it's in three parts um that and um, thank you Dan. No, that, that, that's absolutely brilliant i would i would strongly recommend that we do that um yeah, it, it, we do it because it's important and we, uh, and we love it. So I think um, just from the comments, I think it speaks volumes. Thank you, Professor Daniel Mills, for your time. And we will let you go to, we know that you're a, a busy man. So thanks again. And guys, get in touch. Get yourself booked on an open day, uh, Friday and Saturday this week, um, open days. So get on the website, book yourself one of those. Campus tours, the full lot. Um, and that just leaves me and uh, Professor Daniel Mills to say goodbye. Go well and cheers.
Take care.